Hey, Wargamers. Today is September 27th, 2023, and we're going to whip out a quick kind of an upkeep, kind of a vibe check here on the Corvusburg crew. We've got a total of nine adventurers who have been wandering around the wilds up here. Actually, just these two hexes. And you'll know there's a little bit of our upkeep. Now, for those of you that are new to this, let's just do a real quick introduction. This will, uh, since, since there's nobody in the chat just yet, this is a good time to do this. We are not interested in playing the folk version of Dungeons & Dragons. Here in the House of Wargaming, we want to know what it's like to play the game as described in these rules. In fact, there are three rule books involved. DMG, Player's Handbook, Monster Manual, and there are all kinds of hidden gems buried in this book that amount to two different things. Either... No one ever used the rules, or the people that used them never talked about them. And the only way to uncover those little hidden gems of role-playing goodness, the only way to get to the center of this, the, you've got to get past the nougat and down to the caramel, the, 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 the center of this is to play through it. And that's what we're doing here. We're playing Advanced Dungeons & Dragons by the rules. We're doing it solo so we can take a little bit of time, enjoy ourselves really think about this. In our last session, we had a crew of 10. See, we have 10. And and we don't really go into as much detail on each of these characters. We are not exactly... Um, we're not taking one character and steering him through a bunch of hoops that the DM has laid out. We're treating this as far more of a war game than people typically do. These are our pawns, and we're not really doing a whole lot of like role-playing, except... We kind of are, but we're using the word role in a different way. In conventional approaches to D&D, they use the term role to mean, what is your character's motivation? What is his personality? How does he act? It's like an actor's role. We ain't doing that. Neil's in the house. That's fantastic. Bradford, Ignoramus, Maximilian, Dart, and Absent-Minded. We got a lot of Texans. You'll love to see it. We don't... Treat this as a role in a play. These are their roles in the party. This is a strike force going on missions. They've got objectives. And the wizard's role is to play support. The heel bot's role is to be a second line fighter and to keep the front line fighters active. The front line fighter's role is... So that's the role playing that we're doing. We're playing with these roles. We got 10 of them and in our last episode. We finally got around to exploring the top level of our mega dungeon. It is called the Ligmatic Cloister of the Bofahart Mountains. And on the way, we met a caravan of guys who, thanks to our personable paladins, told us about the Lost Pass of Dee's Nuts Road, or alternatively, you can call it Dee's Nuts Pass. Now, we thought when we first rolled up this hex that there was no pass through these mountains, but it turns out there is. It's an old broken one and it doesn't work very well. So I've added that to both the regional map and then we have a local map. So the regional map, this is one 24 mile hex and here's our little town, Corvusburg. And we can take the road to civilization, but to get there, we have to go past. The, here's that little, the little road, the ruined road that once led through the mountains, it takes you right by the cloister. In fact, you can see the little spur off that road. We went down to the dungeons, we had a good time. The first level of that dungeon looks a little something like this, and here's where we talk about the fact that we kept hitting, on the random dungeon, we kept hitting that 6 through 10 result, which is branching paths. So you can see we've got this wonderful little maze. Now I went through and I inked out all these walls, made it clear. We found a, a flight of stairs down to the second level. This room is actually on the second level. you got to take the stairs down, and this is an elevator trap. Now here's where we have to talk about what we did wrong. When we got around to this room here, we, we triggered a trap, but the pit traps only open, at least on in the random dungeon, the pit traps only open on a four through six. So we had all of our tanks walk over that pit, and then, uh-oh, Piscadios, uh, this Ronnie Dio, he is one of our Boom Boom Wizards, he's got Magic Missile, he triggered the trap, fell, dropped to zero hit points. Now, he's back up to, to full strength, because we did... Make it back to town with all of our heal bots intact. We've got a total of, we've got a cure light wounds, and we've got two laying on hands every day that our paladins can do. But when you are knocked out, when you're reduced to zero hit points, you got a concussion. You got to take a week off. 
So we got back on October 1st, and on October 8th, Ronnie Dio will be available to go on the next Delve. As I said, today is September 27th. We have to be very careful with our calendar. And I have um, I have a little, let's see where though, I think it's in the orange. I have, nope, that's not it. Here we go. Here it is. So we left, we actually left in our last session, we left on the 27th, we hit the cloister on the 29th, which of course is two days away, and we returned to town on the 1st of October. So that was the last session, and now we are effectively up to October 10th. We've made it back to town, and we have some upkeep things that we have to do. So let's do those. The first thing that we should take care of is we came out of the dungeon with a total of 550 gold pieces. Divide that, oh, I forgot to mention the elevator trap. Our thief, Bianca Sensori, got eaten by a Gru. She triggered a trap. Elevator descended to level 2 for 30 turns. That means 5 wandering monster checks. We hit it on the first check. She died. We don't know what happened to her. We'll find her remains maybe when we go down there. Who knows? Maybe we even run into her again. But what this means for us is we have 9 survivors. That amounts to a total of... 61, here's my note, 61 gold pieces or 61 experience points. Now, we didn't fight anybody. We encountered a couple of were-rats. We ran into some NPC parties. We'll circle back to that a little bit later. But as far as upkeep is concerned, the first thing to be aware of is on October 1st, you have to pay your 100 gold pieces per level per character. This is your motivation. I've already subtracted that 100 points. So uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, what this means is, and then we have to buy another week's worth of food for our, our journey. When you're in Corvusburg, when you're in safety, you don't have to track your daily expenses. That's part of what that 100 gold pieces a month is all about. So ultimately what happens is everybody goes up by 61 gold pieces and then down by 103. 100 for the upkeep, 3 for the food. So let's take a look at where we're at. With about 15 hours of play under our belts, our cleric is at 350 experience points, give or take. Our wizards, are with the, our best wizard, is at about 450. The others are at 200. So, you know, another, another you know, we're 10% of the way to the first level. But we've been fortunate that we've only lost one PC. Unfortunate in that we keep kind of nickel and diming. We're getting 50, 60, maybe 100 experience points per delve. Not great, but, you know, all we need to do is find that one big gem and blam, everybody levels. Jeff Capes, 162. Argoth Hammerfist, 162. Right, so our fighters, and our fighters have been laid up. So, like, Swolgar, he's a, he's a, our, our strongest character. He's only got 105 experience because he's missed half the adventuring. And then our other two guys uh, are, you know, right about the 200 level. So we're doing okay. But now we get to look at a new fun little mini game that you get to play when you play this game by the rules. Remember I said you have to pay your upkeep, 100 gold per level. The higher level you are, the more cash you got to spread around. I'm sure this village loves having us here because, man, we are really helping the economy grow. And as long as that line goes up, what do they have to complain about? Let's be honest here. This whole chance of contracting disease things is kind of mitigated by the fact that we've got two paladins who can lay on hands and cure diseases. Oh, boy, that's a good point. We should look at that. They can cure diseases. Is it once per week? Is it once per day? Well, there's only one way to be sure. And it doesn't take long to just stop. Now, the OSR guys will tell you, oh, this game works best when you use rulings, not rules. You should just let the DM decide. Because you got to keep things moving. you got to keep things interesting. It's the wrong attitude, man. The right attitude is play by the rules. It doesn't take that long to go to Paladins. We all know what the opposite-facing page looks like. And here we're, we're already there. The ability to cure disease. This can be done once per week for each five levels of experience. So if we only get two injuries, two diseases show up, we're only going, you know, that's fine. Our, our paladins will instantly be able to boop, take care of the negative effects. But I think it is still worth going through the process to show you how easy this is. For If, if you're playing AD&D and you've only got one character to track, first of the month, you just erase your 100 gold and you roll your dice to see if you, you've got. Now, there may be some other monthly things you have to do, but I haven't 
stumbled onto those yet. Go ahead and throw an answer in the chat or hit me up on Twitter. I'm at not John Miles in there. So let's walk through this real quick and just kind of take a look at it. You check every month for a chance of diseases and for a chance of parasitic infection. So that's two different things. Um, and Gary says, look, you're going to check, you may wish to check each character. All right. So this is already a may different, you know, gentlemen can disagree on this particular rule. The, and it's important to point this out. Most, excuse me, most of the rules in this rule book are you have to do this. You should, you should, you should, you ought, you must. This is a you may. Now we are going to do that. Well, first of all, we're going to do this because people don't do it. And it's worth walking through. The general rule of thumb here is all the rules that the gross smelly nerds who think they're good at D&D never use because it's so boring, we use those. Because, you know, it's just, it's part of the game. Anyway, we are going to be doing this once per month, and, and Gary's a smart cookie. So he says, hey, by the way, check each and every time the character is exposed to a carrier in some way which will allow the disease to be communicated. If we had fought those giant rats, there's rules in the monster manual for the chance of contracting a disease when you're bitten by giant rats. Uh, were rats, excuse me. But this is just kind of generally speaking, kind of a wrench that DMs can throw at the players. Uh, it says, you know, carriers can be human, animal, insect, food, drink, vermin, dirt, filth. So if you're in a filthy city... If your guys are impoverished, that, that, that's in here, right? So you may want to check every week. And then ultimately, he even says, hey, you know, if you are, and here's the modifiers, right? Adjust the base chance of the disease. So the chance of contracting disease is only 2% per month. Now, I got to roll nine times. And then we can look at these modifiers real quick. Let's just check these out. If you're currently diseased, it's plus 1% that you contract, I guess, another disease. If you're crowded, if, so if you're in the city, it goes up by another percent. Because cities are filthy places. Uh, if it's, and here we go, right? If you're if you're living in filth, if you're living in poverty, if you're Section 8 housing, you, you're going to have another plus one. If your character's old, you have another increase. If, you care, if the character's venerable, another one. Exposure to carrier of communicable diseases. So this is where, if you wind up having like a, a disease cult, or a, what's the Warhammer 40k guy called? Um, the, the chaos god of filth. You can start playing with these, and you can still adding, you can, and you can add more modifiers to this, right? Adjust the base chance by applying modifiers when the final percent chance to contract a disease is found. Roll for each character concerned. There is a thing up here. Um, it's, where is it? Uh, each game month you may check, and then check each, there's something in here. Oh, it's in parasitic infections. Check each and every time the character is supposed to character carrier of disease. Uh, carriers include humans, animal, dust, earth, manure, raw or undercooked meat, swamp, water, etc. So if you're in the swamp, you may be checking once a week for this. <laughs> Forgive the allergies. Um, when the final base, you just roll. So for our guys, it's very easy. We're in a nice, clean village. We're out in the countryside. We're spending some time in the mountains. Here's some interesting modifiers. If it's cool weather, you're less likely to contract a disease. At least the diseases we'll see on the next page. If you're in the high mountains, you're less likely. If you've been aboard a ship for two weeks, less likely, right? Y even though it's a crowded condition, because you're away from the ravening hordes, because you're away from those those filthy peasants and, and landlubbers, your chances go down by 2%. Okay, so we got to roll. And here's what we're going to do. I, oh, I forgot to check. Are, are paladins immune to natural diseases too? <laughs> They are. So we only have seven checks for diseases. We're going to skip the paladins. I'm going to roll seven times, and all we have is a 2% chance. Of course, we're looking for a 0, 0, and a 1 or a 2. So 43, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Look at that. I just checked for seven guys, and it's just that quick. Then we have to look at parasitic infections. Base chance is now 3%. With modifiers, if you're living in filth, plus one. If you're Im eating improperly cooked meat, plus two percent. This could happen if your characters are delving the underdark. If they spend a lot of time in, in dungeons and their supplies are running low, they may have to decide, are we going to eat? So, oh, hey, look, we just killed a giant crab. Do we eat it? We don't have any way to cook this. Your monthly chances go up by, you check at that time, you've got a five percent chance of contracting that disease. Suddenly that create fire, suddenly that create food and water when you're using these rules becomes much more viable. These rules are so People claim that you can't play by them, but you can.
and you and then you go back and you fix it. And they interlock in some surprising ways. And this is one of the ways that they do that. When you don't use the disease and the parasite tables, you're devaluing the necessity of being able to access spells that essentially negate this. Our paladins are huge here. Now, in this case, I think we need to roll for the paladins. They're immune to diseases, but are they immune to parasites? I don't think so. So again, the modifiers, filth, uh, swamp, if you're in the swamp or the jungle, your chances of a parasite go up by 5%. Cool weather, down by one. Cold weather, down by one. As for disease, again, so we're at 3%, but we've got to check nine times. So we got to, we're looking at a 32, a 99, a 14, oh, uh, I'm, that's 47, uh, oh, oh, one. Somebody got it. So our fifth guy caught a parasite. Uh, 41, 23. 28, and 54. So who's our fifth guy? He asked rhetorically because he knows it's Mr. Average. Bum, 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 bum. And he's got a constitution of 11, which is going to be important. Because now that we've determined that he has a parasite, we have to figure out what kind of parasite it is by rolling another percentile dice. Uh, bum, bum. Here we go. And so with result of a 31, he has contracted a, uh, what is this, an intestinal parasite. And we have to roll a D8 to find if it's mild, severe, or terminal. On a 6, it's severe. So he has a severe intestinal parasite that he picked up somewhere. Well, what does that mean? Well, a severe malady will lower the character's hit points to 50% of normal and make him or her totally disabled for one to two weeks, plus a further one to two weeks of time during which the malady is in the mild state. During the mild state, during the period of affliction, the character is unable to perform strenuous activities and must rest. Some treatment must be determined by the DM to allow a shortening. Otherwise, he's out for an additional one to three weeks. So bang, we've lost one of our fighters to a parasite. Oh, and it even he even Gary even provides some additional uh, some additional inspiration here. Gastrointestinal. They cause the loss of one point each of strength and constitution per occurrence. Severe attacks cause such a loss permanently. Terminal cases require one to twelve weeks for fatality. Well, we don't have that. So he uh, and we've already said that. We oh, so his hit points are going to be at half. So he's going to be laid up for a minimum of two weeks. Uh, and we said that uh, we got back on the first. We checked on the first. So it's going to be out until, uh, well, what we'll do is we'll say 10, 15, plus one weeks. But that may not be the case because, uh, like we said, immune to diseases, the ability to lay on hands to cure wounds, heals two points of damage, uh, can only be done once per day. The cure disease of any sort. This can be done once per week for each of five levels. Hmm. So now I turn it over to you guys. Does laying on hands cure parasites? Parasites are not diseases, are they? One thing we can do to help us adjudicate this, and this is one of those areas where, you know, people will say, well, you can't play by the rules because there's things that the rules don't cover. Okay, that's not what we're talking about. Whenever the rules are silent on an issue, wherever the rules are ambiguous, that's the purpose of having a DM. What playing by the rules means is when there's a rule, you use it. And when there's no rule, you use the existing rules as your guidance. So here we have Cure Light Wounds. That's not really what we're looking for, is it? Um, I'm guessing it's a cleric spell. That would be protection from you. Let's do augury, charm, person, silence. Uh, slow poison snake charm. I wonder if one of these uh, were cure disease. So here we go. It's a third level cleric spell. And the guys in the chat are probably one step ahead of me. They usually are. So our third level cleric spell. Are we there? For those of you following along at home, I'm on page 46. And cure disease. Uh, range touch components. One turn. It takes 10 minutes. The cleric cures most diseases, including those of a parasitic, bacterial, or viral nature, by placing his or her hand upon the diseased creature. The affliction rapidly disappears, making the cured creature whole and well in, in whole and well in from one turn to one week, depending on the kind of disease and the state of its advancement when the cure took place. 
To be effective, the cleric must touch the victim, the disease. Oh, okay. So I get that. Okay. So this kicks us back over, and we don't have a DM. We're playing solo. So I will turn it over to you guys. Do you think that a paladin's ability to lay on hands to cure disease of any sort mimics the cure disease spell? If so, our paladins can reduce. But, but remember, we're still taking a bit of a hit. We have a severe case of, I don't know, maybe he picked up a tapeworm and it's finally starting to get to him somewhere. Uh, from one turn to one week, let's roll, uh, I'm going to roll to see how many turns, let's see, there's 12 hours in a day, so that's how many hours, and that's how many days it will last. So three hours and four days. Uh, so if we cure our boy... He's still going to be out for four days, which isn't all that bad, to be honest with you. What do you guys think? Sniffling while looking up the disease table. Yeah, you know, I should. I have, I have allergies. You know, it's, it's as above, so below. The things that happen in the real world somehow echo and, and mimic what happens in the, in the game. I can't tell you how many times I've sat down and I've planned a miniature war game. And I've said, I want to use the raining rules. And then I sit down two days later and it's raining while I do it. Handful of rice and a little rat meat. It's all I need. Oh, I should probably... Neil, uh, says Neil. Maximilian, as a side note, magical aging table is really interesting. The magical aging, like, completely makes... The, it, it defangs and nerfs the speed spell. You, that is such a high price when you start dealing with that. Uh, magical aging. Nah, what are you doing? How'd you get that? Mebic dysentery. Had it fun. Had it once, says Dart Mart. Ignoramus, it was the same page as the disease chart. Lay on hands is just a weaker version of the spell. I, I tell you what, let's do this. I like that, Jeremy Herndon. Jeremy says lay on hands is a weaker version of the heal spell. So what does that mean? Does it not affect parasites? It feels a little cheap to do that right now. Why don't we say this? The the a severe case, it will the the lay on hands does not cure it. It knocks our severe case down to mild. During the period of affliction, the character is unable to perform. Some treatment, a normal period is one to three weeks, okay? So, um, normally we would be, so if we didn't have any paladins, and we just let nature take its course, our boy Meh would be out for one to two weeks, right? Plus another one to two weeks here. Well, we're going to be out for one to two weeks, and I'm going to roll a D6. Let's do it that way. I'm going to roll a D6. On a one, two, or three, he's out for one week. So he's still out for two weeks, but at the end of the two weeks, he's completely cured. Makes sense? I think that makes sense. I think that's probably a, a, a nice compromise for the fact that we, we did get bit by something. And I think that's a, a fun little mini game to work through. And we will continue to do that each week. And I think running through that will mean that uh, we really want to get our cleric up to the, the point that he can cast those third level spells. If it gets to be a real problem, we may wind up having to send one of our boys on the long road east to the, the city that's over here. It's a five-day journey, remember, to try and find a high enough level cleric that can cast it on him and get him back into action that much quicker. But as it is, we are now at the point that Ronnie... and the, So we're, at, we're down Ronnie Dio, and we're out meh average. Because, I don't know, maybe he ate the wrong sushi. Or maybe, like I said, he was eating some, some cave crab. That's it. It's just that easy. I think we're going to need a thief. So I want to talk about replacement characters. I, you know, in the past I've said, oh, you know, first level fighters are free. We made the joke. The elites don't want you to know this. You can just roll them up. I've got 400 fighters rolled up at home. But do I... Do I, doesn't that take some of the sting out of death? I mean, oh, death, we want your sting. We want this game to punish us when we do stupid things like send our thief into an elevator room. So rather than say, well, a thief just magically appears to replace our old thief, perfectly suitable in the case of an ongoing campaign where you're sitting with a DM on one side of the screen and players on another. In our solo campaign, I think we need to suffer a little bit more of a penalty. So what I'm going to do is say when we want 
to have a replacement character, it doesn't just happen. We're going to punish ourselves for it. And we're going to punish ourselves using the only thing that we cannot create ex nihilo, and that thing is time. We have to put in an order and say, hey, thief, hey, and we got we to send a message back to town that we need a thief. And then the thief comes back. In other words, I'm going to roll up a new thief, but that new thief will not be available until, well, I said 11 days, right? October 12th. So until then, we do not have the, the fine traps chance. We don't have a, a scout. Meh gets to lay about now, lucky fella. Says Ignoramus. He does, and he is, I guess. Except that, remember, he's going to come back and he's only going to have two weeks. Oh, let's check his... What's his financial situation look like at the moment? Uh, right here's... So we, we do have those thir those three spare fighters that, I don't know, m maybe for fighters we, we, we are a little more mild with our requirements. Where, where did I, oh, here they go. Cool. Meh. Only has 68 gold. He's only going to have two weeks to come up with the other 40 gold pieces to be able to make rent. Could be an issue. That two weeks. Man, if you're out for a month, that could put you completely out of the campaign. So like I said, replacement characters are going to take 11 days to get in. We have four NPC parties that we have encountered so far. This is the next item on our agenda. We have the other guys. Remember, we found these guys when we were wandering. Oh, no, we found them. Uh, they were in the first room of the Tomb of the Moneylenders. We split some loot with them. They walked off. I haven't fully statted those guys out yet. I haven't statted any of these out. In our last session, we ran into a party of dwarves, and I turned this over to one of my good buds. He may even be in the chat at the moment. Uh, one, of, one of the guys we play with, let's see, Dart Mart, it's no fun to have it. Yeah, is, is, so Maximilian, is the party mail ordering a thief? Yeah, we got a mail order... Um, what rhymes with bride? Ma mail order cut purse, right? I said, hey, look, we had four, we had uh, a total of eight. No, it was, it was actually ten. I kind of screwed up. And I told my bro, hey, can you roll up a party of four dwarves? And, and he was like, yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, and the, what he came up with was four dwarf PCs. They're NPCs, really. And four men-at-arms. So these guys just have uh, studded spear sling. Biffer, Bomba, Beeling, and bo bo yeah, Belling, and Bowling. Bo Bowling. Those are the those are the spear carriers for these dwarves. He said, "You've got Soren, son of Slammer, uh, and he's he's three ten, three foot ten inches tall, one hundred fifty three pounds. He's uh, he's got a warhammer, chainmail. Most of these guys have chainmail." But he, this is a dwarf fighter one. We've got a dwarf cleric one. This is Groin, son of Lo Lowen. And he's got a chain shield and a warhammer. He's an old man. This this old dwarf is 311. He's, the he's pretty tall, 148 pounds. But he is 274 years old. Keely, son of Garrett, is leather longsword. He is a dwarf assassin. Bum, bum, bum. And then a dwarf illusionist one, thief one. So we got an illusionist thief. That is... Uh, Gimme, Son of Glowin. Longsword Dagger, he's got a couple of spells. Probably wanders around with a spell book. But as I said, Illusionist. Very Tolkienian. Very nice. You know, I'm a little surprised. It's a little vanilla for these guys. Asked another friend. Actually, you, you guy you probably know. He plays the character of Fluid the Druid in the epic Trolopulus slash Dubzeron multiverse. And he gave me a party of four humans, a ranger magic user, a fighter, and a magic user. So two fighter types, two magic users. And they are named Dan, Jenny, Gump, and Curran. Now, Gump is interesting. He's got an intelligence of four. And using the NPC tables, he gave me all this information that I don't really care about. Hey, there's also five uh, men-at-arms running around with them. And I said, okay, I got three guys with spears, two guys with bows. That's fine. I'm not going to go over all the details because it might not happen. The reason I'm going through this today is if we encounter another NPC party, we've now got three that we can draw on, two human and one dwarf, and I'll probably roll a d6. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's who we meet. Now, we brokered a peace agreement between these two, between this party and another party, so we already have some, like, good vibes with each of these guys. So, very friendly, but what if our paladins aren't with us? You know, maybe we give ourselves a 10% bonus on the reaction roll. Maybe these guys are mad at us. The dwarves, like I said, 
We rolled 10. I only have eight here. The next time we meet those dwarves, they will have lost two of their men-at-arms to the dangers of the wild. The other important thing to bear in mind is we have now unlocked dwarves as a player race. Our replacement thief has a chance of being a dwarf, but it's that he's going to be coming from the human city, so that's unlikely. Key point, key takeaway here. Don't be afraid when you generate things at the table to give them to your players or to complete strangers and say, hey, well, I mean, you know, friends online, friends from social media and say, hey, I want you to help me create this world. Our dwarves are very tokenish. If you had given those to somebody else, you might have had like Muppet dwarves, which would be fine. We would figure that out, right? We would plug it in and our world would be would surprise us even more. As a solo war gamer, as a solo role-playing game guy, you're constantly looking for ways to explore and surprise yourself. Having one of your friends flesh out an area or a person is a great way to do that. Checking the chat. Ignoramus says, Hovar, I hope whoever it is they have a Russian name. Uh, using, yeah, we are our Ukrainian mail order... Thief bride, uh, right? Those Ukrainian mail order brides, man. You want to talk about thieves? Whoo! Those are some mercenary gals, at least if the memes are to be believed. Jeremy Herdon says using medieval express to get those reinforcements, not with a paladin in the party, let alone two. What else do we got? I think it's time to talk about uh, analysis. Um, uh, we and we've already done a little bit of this. We unlocked a road, and this I really wanted to go over in a little bit more detail because. We, we encountered that merchant caravan. They didn't have anything to buy. I, and kind of like in my mind's eye, what is happening is our our, our party is, is wandering around here through the hills looking for the... They know it's in here somewhere. And they're kind of poking up some valleys. And then they see like a cloud of dust or, you know, 200 people. You're not going to miss that. What, what's that moving through the trees? Look, there's a whole snake. Wow, they're, they're making a lot of noise, a lot of racket. Because if you look at the monster manual entry for merchants, they got a lot of pack animals with them. They're making a lot of racket, so our guys go down and talk to them, and they, they're like, oh, yeah, there's a pass. Don't tell our rivals, okay? Where's this caravan going? Where's it coming from? I don't know yet. We don't have enough information. We know there's berserkers up here. Maybe they're trading with berserkers in civilization. They're the only people using this road, aside from us now, because we backtracked their trail. That's how we found it. Why is this so important? Well, first of all, we let the dice build the story, and then we embellish the story. That's how we do this. More importantly, by rolling a random encounter, a wilderness encounter, and encountering merchants in a place we did not expect them, it reveals more about the world. Turns out there's a road here. That road is important because if you take a look at what it takes to get to the Ligmatic Cloister, you have to go. Now, on the road, you can move fairly quickly. We have a couple of donkeys, and we can take some of the heat off of our, our trundle cleric. He's wearing scale mail. He hasn't been able to upgrade to full chain yet. Once he does, this will go away. But basically what happens is we travel. Okay, so we're in a village and we travel one, two, three, four, five, six hexes by road. And even though we're in the hills, we're traveling at a fairly good speed. But that's still one full day of hiking. Well, hang on a second here. This first, like, morning time, right, until noon, we don't have any encounters. We don't start getting any encounters until we hit this third track. So that reduces our potential rolls for random encounters by one. Because we're on the road, random encounters are more likely to be friendly than if we were in the wilderness. The road counts as civilization. We are rolling on a chance of 1 in 12. And if we get the 1, if we roll that hit, bang then there's a 50-50 chance that it's just a patrol. So we only have a 1 in 24 chance of having a possible um, hostile encounter. Then, if we didn't have this road, which we didn't last time, you would have to check 1, 2, 3, it's like 4 times just in this area before you get to the cloister. Because it's 1 or 2 for travel, 1 in the overnight, and then 1 in the morning. But now when we wake up on day two, we, we check in the pre-dawn, we check it at like noon, I think it is, and then bang, we're already there. So we only have, and this I'm going to rule, because it's a seldom used track, we're going to be checking on the one to ten. There's no chance that it's a patrol. It's going to be a random encounter on the road. Key takeaway message here is, 
when we go out and back, we have like three or four, I can't remember how the math works out, but it's three or four less chances to have a wilderness encounter. Remember, in AD&D, wilderness encounters are killers. You're rolling on the number appearing in the monster manual, which is... Oh boy, it's folded over. Sorry, librarians. If you encounter something like... Well, let's go to men, right? In in a dungeon, or goblins is a good one. In a, in a dungeon, on the first level of a dungeon, you're likely to meet something like five to... It's like six to 15 goblins. But here, you're going to encounter 40 to 400. So you're running every time. Wilderness encounters are rarely your friend. We got really lucky that it was a merchant man encounter and that we have a couple of paladins who could sweet talk him into giving up, giving up the game that we've got this road here. So that's a huge win for our guys. And I think it's really important to mention that even though we were only at about 200 to... What's the highest? Like 350, 450. After all of these sessions, only you know, only one of our guys is like a quarter of his way to leveling, but we have found significant upgrades in our campaign. The game has changed, and we've found ways, we've found solutions to in-game problems using the in-game rules. This is how slow progress still feels fresh, still keeps the game interesting. Fifth edition, you're done with first level at the end of the first session. Quick, I gotta get my power up. I gotta get my power up. No, you don't. You don't have to get your level ups because the game itself will help you like level up your game. I like the idea of berserkers and merchants trading. Maybe the merchants trade for furs and give the guy. Yeah, maybe the merchants take furs and give them iron weapons and fire water. Maybe they're that kind of berserkers. We didn't really decide yet. Uh, map trends. Raw chaos is good. Let's take a look at this map that we generated and, and kind of anticipate. Now, you don't want to anticipate too much because uh, the more you direct the action, the less you are surprised and the less real exploring you're doing. I already talked about this a little bit. We have a, a strong trend in this dungeon of branching paths, branching paths, whereas in this dungeon, things were much more chaotic. This is the lost tomb of the um, money lenders. A little bit of everything, you know, good, good even mix. That's one style of dungeon. A literal maze only broken by a few rooms. Now, I feel like we, towards the end, we started hitting a lot more rooms and chambers. And, you know, who knows? Maybe we'll, we'll bang out some chambers here. But one thing I did want to show you is I specifically went with four squares to the inch on this map. To keep it small so we could kind of map out level one right away level two i'm going to go to five squares per inch and i've already done the math and figured out here's this room up here in the corner it goes down to level two i felt the need to put that in there because as we map out this level a we have more room on our page because we have a couple i think it's like you know ultimately it works out to like 10 extra heck uh, squares on the, all sides but as we work our way through, we may run into this room. There may be a secret door to get into this room, which gives us now one, two, three ways to get to level two. When we want to race down to level three, one of these may be closer to the stairs to level three. There may be another flight of stairs up, which will give us another room somewhere in one of these blank spaces. So, you know, the, keeping track of this stuff matters. This room right here, we had stairs go up a level. So, hey, that goes to, and we got really lucky because this flight of stairs that goes up a level, by checking it out, it's right here. I added it to the map already. If that room had been up this way a little more, then I would have had a problem because those stairs would have gone up to into the stream. In fact, we still might have that problem somewhere in here. This, you know, this lake is like right here. The little pond is right here. So the, I, the other thing to be aware of is that our entrance is the sinkhole that leads down to these stairs. So we're probably like 20 feet below the ground, below this surface even. And I'm thinking, you know, that's, what does that mean? You know, it's like 10 feet down and then 10 feet down the stairs. So not a particularly deep stream and pond, uh, but, you know, maybe it gets a little deep. Maybe the dungeon is a little deeper here. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Um, it's a dungeon, right? We don't have to worry too much about everything making sense. Um Big question. Big thing to observe. 
You can tell where we went first because of these one-way doors. If you're doing Appendix A and you're mapping this dungeon out in downtime, then you could leave these open. Discretion must prevail. That's the watchword of the day. For us, we can't do that. Our party walked down this hall, and it's a hall. This is a wall. So when I come back around and they approach from this direction, you have this discrepancy to resolve. Well, the, the dice said there's a corridor going this way. How do you resolve the fact that there's a wall there? Well, for us, there's a little chart, a little table. It's easy enough that the this becomes a one-way door, basically. Is it an illusion? Is it a, a one of those doors that you can't see from this direction? There's like a seamless door, and when you pass through, it shuts behind you? Maybe. Maybe that's what all of these are. But I do think it's important to mention that, you know, had we come through here and gone this way, then maybe the, so in this case, you can tell, um, we explored this hall first and then this hall second, and that's why there's a one-way door going this way. Um, if we had explored this way first, then maybe it would be a one-way door going the other way. But, you know, that's, this is where, which way you choose, and we talked about this in the first episode, go back and watch that. The way that you choose to follow your path through the random wilderness will help you determine where the grasslands are. And, you know, you can kind of steer things in your general direction. Same thing here. One of the, the ways that you can kind of strategize about this, we said we're going to check all the south first. Uh-oh, where are rats? We're going to do the side as far from the where are rats as we can. So we kind of went here and then up here and then down here, and then we'll clear this quadrant. But we do have a lot of doors. You know, you can see there's two doors here. If we have a 30 by 30 foot room, then it's just going to have, you know, two exits in that wall. There's no way of getting around it. There may be some secret doors leading out into the hallway. So much more chaotic, much more, uh, uh, but e even with the chaos of rolling for everything, themes start to emerge. And in the lower levels, you'll see a theme that nobody ever really talks about, but we'll talk about that when we get there. Um, big question, how do we restock this? This is one for you guys in the chat. Uh, what happens when we come back here? You know, we're going we're gonna to have guys passing through this room. The first time the room just had some treasure. Well, we looted it. Does that mean this room is empty forever? If there's a potential for restocking, then, you know, we may want to run up here and check this level two room. It's a nice safe patch. We can dive in, see what's there, and dive back out. Maybe we get lucky and we hit that unguarded treasure. We get to roll and we double, right? Instead of 100 platinum pieces, maybe we get 200 for nothing. So, but that's only if we restock. If we say we never restock, this becomes a static dungeon. I'm not crazy about that. Tell me what you think. I, I was thinking one way you could do it is just, hey, the first of the month, psh, everything resets. You have to recheck the contents of each room. So now you have added time pressure that if you're trying to clear a level and, and like completely map it, you got to get back there as fast as possible because you've only got one month before you have to fight your way through all these rooms again. Or do you say when you hit the room, there's a 50-50 chance. First roll the D6. On a 1, 2, or 3, restock. Uh-oh, we have to restock this. Let's roll the D20. Uh-oh, it's empty. Or maybe you just let the 60% the, the chance of it being empty control your restocking. Tell me what you think. And we talked about the elevator. Now, here's a question for you guys. Uh, there was some discussion in the comments after our last video. We, we talked already in this video about the, tr the trap door doesn't automatically trigger. If you don't know it's there, people can keep walking over it, and we checked for every party member. Miss, 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 bing, Ronnie Dio triggers it and falls. Well, now we know it's there, so nobody else is going to trigger it. What about this elevator, though? This elevator room, um, our thief stopped, waited for the other guys to catch up. She was 30 feet ahead, and after, like, two segments, not enough time for the party to catch up to her, the floor fell out. The elevator dropped down, and... I'll also point out, the reason my elevator room on this map is a dotted line is I don't know how big it is. Yeah, the elevator, the, the top floor is 20 by 20, sure. But it drops into a room, it could be anything. I got to roll in that room chart, and I got to disregard with a minimum size of 20 by 20. Where are the exits? Are they doors? Are they passages? I don't know. Hmm, coming to think of it, this must have been a chamber. So it's got to drop down into another chamber. That's probably the way to go. But, I mean, if it's like a, a 40 by 40 room, 
then, you know, what does that mean? We'll figure that out. But I thought that was important. And if we had done the, well, the trap doesn't trigger on a one, two, you know, on a one, two or three, we could have passed right through there, not knowing about it. And anytime we came back this way, it would have triggered 50% of the time. However, if you go back and take a look at the Dungeon Master Guide, and the way we've been adjudicating this is uh, Appendix A gives you that trap, but there's no real hard and fast rules in this in these three core books for how to adju adjudicate traps. So for us, it made sense to say, well, if we have a trap here, it's guarded by a trap door, let's look at the tricks and traps section, which says... Uh, for uh, a trap, you know, the it, three and six chance to fall in. Now, you don't, you're not have to buy by this if you're designing your own dungeon. You could say the trap triggers when somebody that weighs 250 pounds walks on it. You could say the trap triggers, you know, uh, when anybody less than 250 walks on it or a one in six chance, however you want to do it. But we went with a three and six chance to fall in, okay, because the, it's, it's the next nearest guidance that's provided. However... I don't see an elevator on this. So I think we're okay that, you know, you get a segment or two. And if you hurry, you can even race through this one-way door. See the little one-way door there? Maybe that's part of the trap is that you got to, if you want to go this way, no, there's nothing over there. Why would you? But, um, you know, our party's going to be sticking together. So if we want to go down to level two using this elevator, we can just go stand there and then we go down. Uh, but we don't have to. So I think we're okay on what we did last time. And I think that, you know, knowing the elevator is there and saying, yeah, you take that elevator down and after 30 turns, it goes back up. We're good. We got that covered. Um, no, but, oh, no, I, that's right. I got to check my notes. You got to read these things carefully because I missed a very important word. Um, before I look at that, let's take a look at the, um, let's take a look at the, Chat real quick, do all these suggestions disappear when the live stream is over? The suggestions, no, the live stream, you can go back and watch the live stream on the rebroadcast too. There's a, there's a button on the, the user interface that you have to say, show me the live chat. Monsters can restock, maybe items don't, says Maximilian. All right, Dart Mart says, where's the incentive? Maybe the monsters stock it later, like the new monster moves in and restock the items or cultists. Uh, Jeremy Herndon says new monsters would move in new items, but previous monsters that live there and weren't killed should make it secure, right? It's a great point. If we encounter a monster and we don't eliminate it, it's still going to be there one way or the other. We ran into were-rats. We know we have an increased likelihood of encountering were-rats in this dungeon. Um, however, I, it is important to point out we ran into three NPC parties. They done a pretty good job clearing things out for our for us before our party even got there. I, you know that, that's kind of how we rationalize and justify things. But I was talking about the elevator trap because this is interesting. Let's read it very closely. Uh, Blade trap do, put. Wait, where is it? Um, just got the treasure is guarded by. No, that's not it. I, was it tricks and... I think it was tricks and... Maybe it is in there. Uh, secret door. Pit, pit. Uh, oh, right. 20 by 20 elevator room. Yeah, here it is. Okay. 20 by 20 elevator room. Party has entered door directly ahead and is in the room. Descends one level when on a center for 30 turns. Ah! And, and I, I think this is important because when you get tricks and traps, there's actually a 15% uh, chance that you get an elevator. 15%. The only question is whether it descends one, two, or five levels. That's crazy. But look, this is the key word right here. Party has entered. Party has entered. This trap does not spring until the whole party is there. We goofed. We should have had the entire party descend that one level and blunder around on level two. Oops. Got to remember that for the elevators. Elevators do not affect the scout. They affect the party. The only reason I don't feel too bad about that is we specifically said our scout is going to be like 30 feet ahead of the party. So, you know, there we go. Dart Mart says, now that you know where they are, they're no longer where rats, they're their rats. Ba -bum -bum -bum. I'm totally stealing that. I think that's it. Uh, I don't know. You guys got any questions? 
we've been going at it for 45 minutes and we really didn't even do any delving this time around. Maximilian's got to go. He's got to go get some sleep. So yeah, I think that's all the reason we need to cut it short. Maybe don't leave activate, activated for Bianca because she is a strong and independent women's. How would the trap know when the whole party is in it? Asked Jeremy Herndon. I, it's a great question. So in my mind, again, I think you just say, look, it's two segments. That's enough time for the whole party to get in unless you've got that advanced scout. It's not enough time for everybody else to get in there. But I mean, how would the trap know? I don't know. Maybe there's buttons and she was playing with them and that's what triggered the trap. And got her eaten by a Gru. Now, I'm going to keep saying that she was eaten by a Gru, but ultimately we don't know what happened and we won't find out until we take, take these stairs down to level two. This is the only way we know to level two to find this room. That's going to be kind of our goal in the next session, which, well, that maybe this is level two. I don't know if we're ready for that. I think maybe we'll, we're probably better off filling in the blank spaces on our level one map. Uh, as far as restocking goes, I think for any of the rooms and chambers, I think you got to re-roll. I think you just roll because again, like I said, there's a 60% chance. Maybe you ignore the traps results. Let's, well, take a look at that let's see what the reroll. because for restocking maybe that's it maybe it's just monsters is the only result that you pay any attention to but i do think that the room contents here is a suitable uh is a, is a suitable way chamber room contents monster only is is legitimate monster and treasure special or contained stairway yeah that's not going to happen and then track Trick, Trap, and Treasure, those don't apply. So I think you only have the 13 to 17, so that is what, 10 to 25% chance. I think that's probably the best way to do it. Most of the rooms that you enter will continue to be empty. You're not going to find any track tricks or traps or treasure hmm, because it didn't show up the last time. So you really only have a 25% uh, chance of encountering a monster. And I think that's appropriate, right? Monsters wandering around the dungeon. Maybe some guys came up from level two. You won't know until you roll the dice. And that's pretty much, I think that's what we'll do, right? I'm headed on vacation on Saturday for a week. When is my next live going to be? Pfft, man, I didn't know I was doing this one until 20 minutes before I turned the camera on. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm hoping to do another one on Friday. But we'll have to see how, see what kind of curveballs life throws my way. Keep an eye on Twitter. You know, it's it's either this, usually it's either at this time or I start them at um, like three-ish my time, which is nine o'clock Eastern Standard Time. But I do like to mix it up so we get some of the Aussie bros, some of the Asia bros and, uh, you know, or the early morning. Is it early morning, I think, for the uh, for the Euro bros? You know, we, we want the Russians to be able to participate. We want the, we, we like those guys. Uh, we do want the Eastern Europeans to participate we want to at least have give them the opportunity and you know those uh those nutty nutty romans and all that any dwarfs today no no dwarfs today it was just uh all we did macho was some like logistics cleanup divvied up the treasure i think we gave one extra gold piece and experience points to ronnie dio since he took the conk on the noggin and uh just as a you know little gratis uh we did have one of our fighters macho one of our fighters caught a parasite he, he got a tapeworm, he got a devil tapeworm, and um, even with the laying on of hands, he's going to be laid up for two weeks. So that's going to make it tough for him to make rent in November 1st, but we'll we'll see what happens, right? Maybe that two weeks, maybe, maybe that's when our big stash is going to get hit. We'll find out. Till next time, I'm praying for you.